We are really thrilled to be here today to be invited to uh, present at this conference. And uh, so uh, hopefully uh, you will have some questions for us afterwards. And uh, it'll be a, a dialogue and not just a one way presentation here. So we're going to be talking about modes of uh, conveyance. And um, what we're going to be talking about is a little bit of statistics because we're researchers and we just can't not put that in our presentations. And then we'll get on to the, uh, some of the studies that we've done on different modes of conveyance. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about adapting to change, which we all know is not easy. So. Number of jobs for EMTs and paramedics, I got this out of the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, Occupational Outlook Handbook, and hey, it's looking pretty good. Um, big numbers coming up here over the next um, eight years, large increase in number of jobs, that's great. But of course, we're here because there's a downside to this too, and that's a lot of musculoskeletal types of injuries, very high rates, we're all aware of that already. Where those come from and what is the nature of them, sprains and strains, back injuries, overexertions, patient handling, we're aware of that. And up and going uh, up and down stairs and activities involving the cot. So no surprises there. So we're going to be talking to you today about modes of conveyance uh, because they do make a difference, as you've already heard today from um, experience. And because researchers, again, we're going to be talking about statistically significant differences. Actually, these are real differences. They're more than just uh, statistically validated. So how do we make assessments of equipment to determine whether they're better or not? We measure things like muscle activity. Uh, we uh, measure things like the forces that are being exerted by uh, paramedics. So when we talk about reduced ground reaction forces, well, we have basically fancy scales that people stand on and they lift things, and we see how much weight they're actually holding in their hands. And we ask them, what's your perception of this condition versus another condition? And we also measure things like time, because we know even if something takes less effort, if it takes a whole lot more time, you're not going to be interested. That's very common across a lot of different workers. So Steve's going to take over now and talk about stair descent devices. Hi, good afternoon. <clears throat> First question for you today. Where does it seem the people are located that need transport? Upstairs. Upstairs. In the back bedroom, as far away from the front door as possible. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that the ambulance pulls up and they say, we got to go up there. Yeah, okay. I get it. So, and then we say, okay, well, let's take a look at those stairs. Oh, yes, okay. Um, there are definitely some challenges, and the first thing every paramedic I've ever talked to says is, why can't there just be single story homes? A lot of our problems would go away. You know, why can't everybody just live in a, a you know, one-story apartment? Yeah, okay, well, here we are. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about some research we did. This was related to the emergency evacuation from high-rise buildings, but it gave us a chance to compare different stair descent devices that you may have opportunities to come across and use. And I think you'll find this interesting. What kinds of devices? Well, these were primarily uh, hand carry devices, uh, track type devices, and what we call sled type devices. And what we did was measure the physical demands as people did a stair descent task. It was, it was a laboratory type study. Yeah, we took over the stairwell in the building for a little while, scared everybody else away. But uh, you know, we were able to look at the physical demands, we were able to look at uh, some performance measures, and we were able to look at some usability, or at least collect some basic usability data. And we did this actually looking at three staircase widths. Uh, you can see here 0.91, 1.12, and 1.32 meters. And we had people do this in an urgent mode and a non-urgent mode. And, you know, spoiler alert, we're just going to say, I'll tell you what, there wasn't actually much difference in the, in the biomechanical measures that I'm going to talk about 
when we compare urgent and non-urgent. And when we're concerned about performance, well, in terms of time to descend the stairs with these devices, well, then we only looked at the urgent conditions because, well, if you weren't in a hurry, what does it matter? Okay. So we looked at different hand-carried devices. What we have is uh, what we call the extended handle stair chair. Uh, you may have seen it, this yellow stair chair where the handles pop out in front. Uh, they extend out a little bit. We had a basic stair chair, which is this uh, one over here to the right. Uh, we had a manual carry. Again, I know that's not something you would typically do, but on the other hand, if there wasn't any device available, well, we just wanted to know what that the data would look like if we were just doing this the old-fashioned way. And then we had what was called a fabric seat. Again, this is this was in the context of a, maybe a mass evacuation, and you know maybe somebody with a disability might keep one of these things in their apartment, in their office, whatever, so that people could get them out. But then it might be whomever shows up to help out with that would be using this. So it's important to understand how those work. Now, that extended handle stair chair, we tested with the front person going down the stairs facing forwards. Okay? Now, that changes the dynamics are a little bit. I imagine a lot of you don't do that, but when you do do that, it makes it much easier to go down the stairs. Okay? We looked at five different types of track devices. And without trying to you know, use brand names here, we, uh, we used what we call the standard device, okay, which was, uh, you know, in this case, a Ferno device. But that and the Striker were pretty similar, so we just selected one. But then there was this other one up in the upper right-hand corner that is a very similar device, but it was narrower and we were concerned how people would respond to that. And then there's this other, we'll go down to the bottom left corner, there's another device called, what we refer to as a two-wheel device. And the reason is because when you go around the corner on a landing, you actually tip it up on the front two wheels and it's like a hand truck as you go around the corner, okay? Uh, and then we had this other device that was up in the upper left corner, what we call the long track device because it had very long tracks. And we had this other device here, which was really kind of interesting. It was a, the, the occupant sits in it facing the, the, uh, the evacuator. And it's a one person evacuation with all of these devices that you see here, okay? Now you could use two. Um, some of them had additional handles that you could use, but they were really designed for single person evacuation. And so that's how we tested that. Now, this, this rear-facing one, you're, the, the person is facing the, uh, the, the, the person who is taking them down the stairs, so you've got to make sure you're smiling the whole time and not you know, keep them uh, from becoming afraid. And it's, it's actually interesting to ride in this device because it's a very different sensation than when you're going down the stairs facing forward on one of these other devices. Um, and it's an interesting process where you see two sets of handles there. You have to change from the curved handles when you're going down the stairs to what I would call the lower wheelbarrow type handles. And then you got to tip it up on the front wheels and get it around the corner. And then you switch back to the handles as you start down the stairs. A little practice is a good thing. Okay. Then we also had sled type devices. Uh, we had what we call a roll-up uh, device. It was just, you know, basically plastic that you could roll. Uh, we had a corrugated device. Um, this is the low-cost solution that some places may try to implement and put, you know, have a, a, some of these in the closet, especially if in a, in a, in a hospital-type situation or a nursing home-type situation. We had. Uh, another device called a subway sled, uh, which was actually interesting. This was a single person evacuation sled where the person went down in front of the device and sit there, wow, I'm going to get run over. Interestingly enough, there was a high friction component right under the patient's legs. So you would push down on the patient and that engages that and, would, and you could have a very controlled descent. When you got to the landing, there was actually rollers underneath the torso. You lift up on the legs, you roll it around the corner, and then you set up to go down the next flight of stairs. Then there was an inflatable device. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the hover jack. 
um, which we had inflated two of the four chambers. When you get much more than that, it gets a little unstable when you go around the corner. But uh, that was one. And then there was a, what we call a hard shell device. It was like almost looks like a children's sled that you would see in the wintertime, but it has rollers on the bottom. So you drag it across the floor, and you go down the stairs behind this thing with a belt essentially strapped around your waist. You, you, you take this belt and you hold it down. And it's like you, you walk down behind it and control the descent. You look scared. Yes. Okay, I understand. And then there's this uh, fabric mat here, which was a two-person device, had a, uh, you know, a fair amount of friction, so that you know you would drag it down. It would go downstairs. But you know, again, some of these devices that had more friction then became a lot more work when you went through the landing because now you got to drag this thing on the flat. So okay, let's talk about this. We, we ran these studies with 12 participants. These were experienced firefighter paramedics that were in these studies. Our occupant was a rescue Randy, which, you know, 73 kilograms. And, uh, you know, what did we measure? Well, we measured the duration of the evacuation. Uh, we measured some electromyographic data. Uh, from the latissimus dorsi, the erector spinae, so your back muscles essentially, and, and then some of the arm muscles, the deltoids, and the biceps. So we were trying to find out how hard the muscles were working. We looked at heart rate as well to get an idea of the overall physical exertion. And we had perceived exertion ratings. We looked at spine motion. We looked at some usability. But because um, my colleague here would also like to have time to speak today, I'm only going to talk about the duration of the evacuation and the electromyography and the heart rate data. Okay, so let me jump into the findings. Now, if we take a look at the um, stair descent speeds, these are the hand carry devices. And what you'll see here is our, our measure is you know, the speed down, the, the, basically the time it took to, to do this task. Um, we could figure that out, we knew the distance, so we could calculate the speed. And we're, we're comparing that with some evacuation speed data. That's what this big pink zone is on this chart. Because this is, this is some data that's out there that conveys um, you know, how fast pedestrians go when they're evacuating a building. So if you were trying to get somebody out of a building, again, think of, going back to the context here, of, you know, if you're evacuating a high-rise building, you have pedestrians going down, but you may be taking somebody down who's been injured or has a disability in either case. And you want to know, is that going to obstruct the flow in the stairwell? Okay. Well, interestingly enough, if, if, any, of, if any of these manual or hand carry devices, with the exception of the, of the extended handle, would slow down traffic. The extended handle, because the person in the front was going down the stairs facing forward, was much faster. Okay? Interesting. The uh, track type devices all were pretty consistent in terms of, you know, they, they, they were all, you know, within the pedestrian evacuation speeds, so they would not slow down the flow. And interesting, the uh, two wheel device here was actually the quickest device. You know, uh, Carolyn was talking about st statistically significant differences. This one stood out as being statistically faster than the others. Okay? Uh, here's the standard one over here, which you guys may be more familiar with. But uh, there weren't a lot of differences between these. If we look at the sled type devices, you'll know that the pink, notice the pink zone isn't even on there because these devices are actually pretty slow. Okay? We're, we're going at about you know a, a third to half the speed that you could go with those track type devices. Okay, in fact, so that pink zone's off the top of the chart, and there were some differences. Um, you know, the ones that had two people did go faster than the ones with only one person. Now, you know, again, as I said, these were slow compared to uh, the other devices. Okay, let's take a look at the heart rate data. The heart rate data is showing us that uh, you had that extended handle stair chair where the person went down facing forwards it had, a, had a lower physiologic load. In other words, less demand 
on the in the, on that team as they were going down the stairs with that device compared to the other uh, hand carry devices, and certainly you know much better than the manual carry. That was the hardest task that we measured. Okay. When we, if we look at the track type devices, that standard type stair chair had the lowest heart rate. Okay, so you know the chairs that you guys may be using or familiar with uh, does pretty well. Okay, if we look at the sled type devices, well, you know that's the data get pretty complex, but um, typically what we find here is that that fabric mat and that actually the inflatable had the lowest heart rate. Um, and, and these data are, support, are split out into, you'll, you'll see two bars, you know, for the fabric mat, for example, the follower and the leader, because we tested people in both of those positions. Because it turns out that, well, as you're going down the stairs with one of these devices, the guy, the guy behind as you're going down the stairs has all the, is doing all the work, right? But when you get to the landing, it changes. The guy who's dragging it through the landing has got to do all the work in the front. And then once they got back on the stairs, then it shifts over again. So it's interesting how that trades back and forth. Let's take a look at how hard the muscles are working. And what we're seeing is that if we look at the hand carry devices, you know, that extended handle stair chair, you know, we, we're talking about cumulative loading. That's what we were looking at. You know, we were looking at that muscle use over time, and that extended handle stair chair was much lower than what we were seeing with um, the other types of stair, hand carried stair descent devices. And there wasn't much in the latissimus dorsi here. That's your muscle here. That's like a pulling muscle. Well, you're not using that when you're carrying a device, uh, carrying this uh, chair. If we look at the track type devices, that standard chair uh, has the lowest uh, had the lowest erector spina or your back muscle use. So that's saying that that actually works very well. Okay. Um, that the long track also had low uh, low back muscle demands because it had a it had a, a, a speed regulator on it. So all you had to do was basically release the the, the brake and it would go down the stairs. It had a speed governor, so you didn't have to control it. But there's some other issues with that that we'll see here in this slide because if we look at the deltoid, well, then you get some pretty high deltoid activity um, as that thing has to be pushed off the stair at the stairs at the bottom. But again, the standard um, shows good bicep, low, low bicep use and low deltoid use. So it's again suggesting that that's a pretty good device for what you guys need. This is just showing, okay, the that long track, when you get to the bottom step here, the deltoid issues, because you have to actually almost lift the back end off the stair because it, 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 it stops there. And so it became very physically demanding. And as far as the biceps with this two-wheel device, well, when you tip it up on two wheels, now you're using a lot of biceps, whereas the other chair like the standard, you tip on the, it goes onto four wheels, you roll it through, and then you tip it back and off you go. So it's a different process. Um, but on the other hand, because you're just going on those two wheels, this also was pretty fast going down the stairs. Um, and then the, that rear facing, I said, as you, uh, you had to switch handles and you could see, here's, here's the going through the landing, uh, you really have to tip it up quite a ways. Uh, and so there's a lot of deltoid use and a lot of bicep use. If we look at the sled activity, the, the muscle activity with the sleds, um, you know, that fabric mat actually worked very well on the stairs. It was significantly different from all the others. So, you know, having that little bit of friction really helped out. If we look on the landing on the, you know, it, it flips around because now that little bit of friction results in the highest force uh, muscle force required once you're on the landing because now you've got to overcome that friction as you drag it around the corner. So um, an interesting problem. 
So if, if I summarize this, what we see is that you know, the hand carry devices are attractive because they're less expensive, but we can see that there's higher physical demands, okay? Uh, they're slower, unless that lead person is, is an allowed by the, by the design to walk forwards down the stairs. If you're walking backwards down the stairs, you can't carry a, a patient, you obviously can't go very fast, okay? But this changes considerably if you can go forwards. The track type devices, there's good data here to show that they do reduce the muscle use, especially in the back muscles. They, they're much faster overall, okay? There is some, you know, there is more use of the latissimus dorsi on some of those devices because those devices, you know, they want to go down the stairs, so you got to pull back. But I don't think that that's to the level that's going to cause problems for the evacuator, okay? Uh, as far as the sled dump type devices, well, there's low muscle demands on the stairs. It's not bad, but, uh, you know, some of the issues there are getting people in and out of those devices because, you know, they're probably sitting on the floor. It depends where they are and how you're, how you're using those devices. And there are certainly actually some high demands on the landing as you're trying to, to get somebody around the corner. Uh, and that was a key piece here. So, you know, in conclusion on this, on these stair descent devices, clearly there's the track type devices have some advantages with regards to evacuation speed, the physical demands, and ingress and egress of the occupant. To get somebody in and out of that chair. And if you've got to use a hand carry device, uh, try to find one where the handles can enable you to go down the stairs facing forwards. It's better from a safety standpoint because you can obviously see where you're going, but it, we really see that it reduces the, the physiologic demands and it reduces the biomechanical demands. Okay, let me turn it over to Carolyn who can talk more about cots. So I'm going to talk with you about a couple of studies that we did with uh, some different types of cots. So the first study that I'm going to talk with you about is a study that we did with a couple of manual cots. But what's special about both of these cots is that they're meant to be pushed uh, or pulled rather than being lifted. Both types of cots uh, have legs that the front legs and the back legs are independent, so they don't come up at the same time um, when you're loading or when you're unloading, they don't drop down at the same time. The first uh, cot uh, up on the top here, the red one, uh, that has a ratchet mechanism, and so when the wheels contact, the front wheels contact, the uh, the uh, floor of the ambulance, that uh, signals that the front legs can come up then. Uh, and then once the front legs come up, uh, then there's another trigger in the mechanism that allows the back legs to come up. So that is um, how the safety features work on that. Whereas the yellow cot, um, the second one that we studied there, that has a series of um, uh, buttons and levers that you need to press that the operator presses in order to allow the legs, the front legs first to release and then and then the back legs as you're going into the into the ambulance. Uh, and so I'm going to refer to these cots, I'm going to refer to the, um, the bottom one here as cot one. It's basically one way of holding on to the handle which is um, with uh, your uh, hands uh, uh, open downward there so that you can operate the buttons and the levers. Uh, and I'm going to refer to the uh, cot on top as <coughs> cot two. Uh, and I'm going to refer to it as um, the, with two different ways that you can actually grasp a hold of this. So um, in this first picture here, you can see that this has a pull out handles. So that's one way of grasping and uh, holding on to the cot. I'm going to refer to that as COT2P for the pull-out handles. And then the other uh, handle here is this kind of loop handle, uh, which is below the pull-out handle. And um, 
to that one, I'm going to refer to as COT2, the loop handle. So it's basically three conditions that we looked at here. These two different handles for COT2 uh, and, uh, and COT1 with its one way of grasping a hold of it. And so what we did was we invited uh, 15 EMTs and paramedics to come and participate in a lab-based study, uh, four of whom were, were women. Uh, and we had them do loading, unloading to a simulated uh, ambulance bed and raising the cot. I'm just going to be talking about the loading and unloading, which were actually pretty similar uh, today. We put um, modest, very modest uh, weights on the cot, 23 kilograms for the female participants, 45 for the males, and they're working by themselves uh, here. And uh, what we measured was muscle activity, uh, joint stress, uh, subjective ratings of uh, perceived exertion, time to uh, perform the task, and whether preferences were so some usability uh, that we asked them about. So what did we find? So this particular um, graph is telling you about the muscle activity. And what we have is the COT1 is represented by the white bars, and COT2 is represented by the colored bars. The um, red bars uh, here we see are for the pull-out handle, and the um, gray bars are for the loop handle for um, COT2. And what, basically what you see here is there really isn't a pattern in terms of any one caught or any one type of handle being better in terms of lower muscle activity. So we see, depending on which muscles you're looking at, whether you're looking at the muscles in the arm, which would be the flexor, the ones that are actually grasping a hold of the handle, uh, or the muscles that are more in the shoulder region, the deltoid and the trapezius, or the back muscles, the erector spinae, you see different different patterns there. And so we don't really see any that are completely standing out as being better based on muscle activity. But each one, um, it shows in some muscles to be better um, than another. So a bit of a mixed bag uh, there. What we see when we're asking um, some questions about what their preferences were, and in this slide, things um, that of smaller values are all better. So when we ask about preferences, so what's, the, what's your ranking? How do you rank order these? We see that COT2 uh, was preferred a little bit more to COT1, and I'll mention why in a moment. Perceived exertion was le somewhat less uh, with COT2 versus COT1. And then the duration of the task was actually a little bit slower also with um, the COT2 versus COT1. The, one of the things that we were told by the paramedics was that they were uncomfortable with um, the handle with COT1 because you had to grasp it basically with an a overhand grip. And they were basically saying, if something happens and, I, and my hand slip, I'm dropping the COT, and I don't like that. So they talked about that they might jerry-rig the buttons or the levers so that they could actually grab it underhand so they'd be sure they always had a secure hold of it or they could kind of open up their hands and that still wouldn't release uh, the cot or let it drop. So that was interesting uh, feedback there to understand that their concerns. So this is about letting the cot do the work or you doing the work. So the idea behind these cots, as I mentioned, was you're supposed to just be able to push and pull these cots. You really shouldn't have to actually lift them to get them um, into the ambulance or support the weight as they're coming out because the legs are always there. You've always got one set of legs that are on the ground and one um, set of wheels that's on the ambulance. So you really shouldn't have to have to do anything. But did that? Did the cot design actually um, facilitate that or encourage people to, to do that? And what we see with cot one here up on the top, the white bar, and cot two with the loop handles, you see that the percentage of the trials where people were um, letting the cot do the do the work were lower than when they actually used the pullout handles with cot two. So you were more than 80% of the time they actually were not lifting that cot 
Um, but you saw that performance was more like 50% or so of the time when people were actually kind of helping the cot uh, to, uh, to support the weight. And we have a little bit of um, interest going on here in terms of interaction between anthropometry, in this case height, of the, uh, of the paramedics, and the pull-out handles versus the loop handles on COT2. So you can here we have a shorter uh, paramedic uh, up on the top here, and you can see that when she's using the pull-out handles, there's quite a bit of extension in terms of her arms having to get into position there to manage that COT. Um, some degree of extension, uh, which is basically the, um, the upper arms going back with the taller paramedic on the, on the bottom row there, but not nearly to the extent um, of the shorter paramedic. So her arms look more in a, in a much better posture there when she's using the, uh, the loop handles there. The um, pull-out handles are about 13 centimeters higher than the uh, loop handles, and so you can see that... Um, that anthropometry, that interaction between worker and equipment uh, here is, is um, kind of obvious there. The second uh, study I'm going to talk with you about is a study of a couple of powered cots. And so um, the, the key difference here between these cots is how the legs fold. Uh, both of these are powered. Uh, the first cot uh, up on the top uh, is the striker uh, cot, which has the legs that come up together. Uh, and then the second one is the uh, ferno cot, which has the legs that work independently. Uh, and so in some ways it's a little bit like the manual cot, except the legs go up in different directions, uh, at least the front, front ones do. Um, and so this was a, a test that was, or an evaluation that was done without the extra uh, device uh, that comes out from the ambulance and supports the weight of this. So this is the, the situation that we are looking at was as you see in this YouTube video um, uh, clip that I have here, uh, individual lifting and supporting the weight of the cot as the legs come up or down. So our research methods were somewhat similar to what we had done previously. Um, this time, 16 experience, and when I say experience, I mean experience being a paramedic, not experience with the uh, COTS, because uh, the folks who participated in this study, the COTS were new to them, except for one person that had worked with the striker COT before. But for everybody else, both these COTS were brand new, uh, and they were experiencing both of them for the first time. Uh, and again, this is a lab-based study. They loaded and unloaded onto a simulated ambulance bed. This time, we uh, put, uh, we used three different amounts of weight to simulate patients of different weights, uh, so between basically 100 and 200 pounds um, of weight added. There's no extra equipment, no medical equipment that we put on there, so basically what they're handling is the weights of the simulated patient and the weight of the, uh, of the cot. And what we measured, again, was muscle activity, this time also ground reaction force, so how much weight are they actually holding in their hands, we, we assessed that. Uh, and then we had their ratings of perceived exertion and task time as well. So this is a picture to give you an idea of our lab setup here. So here the person is standing uh, on the force plate, again, kind of a fancy scale, uh, and uh, the wheels are coming up, so basically the person supporting basically half the weight of the cot and half the weight of the weight on the cot, uh, and the other half is being supported by our simulated ambulance bed. And then here the person is uh, holding on to the uh, end here, basically just um, holding the handle, while the rear legs um, retract and the rest of the, all the weights basically being supported uh, by the ambulance bed uh, with the second cot there. I'm going to refer to this cot as cot A and the yellow cot as cot B in the study where we talk about results. So cot A and cot B, and we have the results for the um, muscle activity for the different weights that are on the cot. So red being 45 kilograms, uh, and on through to the uh, higher weights here. So each of the bars, we have the weights increasing. Kind of the overall trend to realize is that there's barely any effect of different weights 
uh, when you're using uh, cot A, but when you're using cot B, you do notice that the increments in weight have incremental effects on muscle activity. So more muscle activity uh, to handle the, the higher weights, uh, the increasing weights on, with cot B. What we also see here is this is the uh, ground reaction force. So what we do is we have a person standing on the force plate and then we subtract off their weight of that. So what we're then just getting is the weight of what's being held in their hands. And you can see here, basically there's no weight on average being held uh, in the hands when folks are uh, working with, the, um, with cot A, whereas with cot B, Again, they're basically holding half the weight of the cot and half the weight of the weight on the cot. Uh, and that shows through readily here. This is the average force. This is the peak loading. And what we see here for peak loading, you see that for cot B, it's even higher than the average loading because that's that momentum that they get when they're ready to lift it. And so there's actually some acceleration of the weight as well. So, um, so you've got that extra uh, force that you're dealing with. And then there's also some pushing force as well uh, when you're um, having to push the cot. Obviously, it's not no force. There is some, some force involved, but it's actually quite a bit less um, between the, the two styles of cots. And again, no difference as the, as the patient, our simulated patient, um, gains weight, but we do see the differences there for the um, cot B. Perceived exertion follows along with actual exertion. And uh, so we see uh, noticeable differences there uh, with cot B and only slight differences uh, when you get to the heaviest weight with cot A. The amount of time adds slower, actually. So for all the things that we're saying that are great about cot A, it is slower uh, and um, noticeably slow noticeably slower than cot B. Does that matter? This is perceived task time. So before it was the actual measured task time, this is perceived task time. And the question we asked them, I think that the legs of this cot fold and unfold too slowly. And so generally the cot A folks were saying, no, nah, we disagree with that statement. Um, and the folks, uh, when they were using cot B, said, oh, well, maybe I sort of agree with you that it does work a little too slowly, and that's because I'm holding the weight the whole time that they're going up and down. Um, so it's the, there's the inverse or the, diff the opposite between the measured task and ta task time and the perceived task time. And when we ask them about the complexity of this, so the cot A has got some buttons to push and you know, you're know you waiting and figuring out, getting up the different legs and everything. So we ask them, do you, I think this cot is unnecessarily complex? In both cases, for both cots, they said, nah, we disagree with that. Not too complex, neither one is to operate. So change, as I mentioned, change is hard. Uh, and so, what do we? What have we learned about change that maybe we can um, share with you, and maybe you can share something with us because it sounds like a lot of you are are making some some big changes. Some of the things that we've learned about through some of our research and change is that it's really key to involve both the the leadership who sets the tone, and also involve the the employees who are going to be using the change, the equipment, the methods, whatever that is. I've heard things today about trialing, lots of field trialing, and trying things out. And if it works, maybe something works, maybe something doesn't work, but you've got to have some flexibility, always interact with the employees, give people an opportunity to train, to use things. I mean, there's got to be time to get proficient. You train on every other medical procedure that you do, so there ought to be plenty of time for training on using new equipment as well. And giving people time to, to reflect and think about these changes as well. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Steve, and he's going to wrap up here uh, with a little bit more that we've learned about change, specifically with uh, paramedics. Yeah. We, we did a study looking at uh, the adoption of a folding slide board 
Okay? The idea was, you know, how many times do you go to the hospital and you want to do a, a lateral transfer and you look for a slide board and you can't find it? Anybody ever had that experience? Yeah, okay. I thought maybe. So the idea was we had developed this slide board in an earlier project where the idea was it would fit on the cot, you know, maybe under the mattress. And the idea was you would have it with you wherever you needed it, okay? And, you know, we had run this by a bunch of folks and done some early usability tests and everything sounded pretty good. So we did a study. We got funded by NIOS to do this, and we basically handed a bunch of these things out to different EMS services in central Ohio that included private ambulance companies as well as uh, fire EMS operations. And we had people uh, do some logging as to when they used this thing, and they filled out a survey that allowed us to assess uh, some of their perceptions of these devices. And what we really wanted to find out is what was involved with getting people to adopt the, and use the device. And the first step of the adoption is you gotta at least have some intention to use, right? If you don't intend to use it, well, it's zero. But if you have some intention to use, and what was the strongest predictor? Well, we did some modeling of the data, and the strongest predictor was the ergonomic or perceived ergonomic advantage. Okay, that had the highest coefficient here. It's the little number in the middle of the chart. But what drove that? What does that mean? Well, they said, well, you know, that means they perceived it was easier on, on my back. It was easy to use. Okay, it was easier on the shoulders. It was compatible with the current equipment that we're using. Okay, and it was smoother for the patient. So all of these things combined together into a, uh, a variable that we call ergonomic advantage. So it's so important that when you introduce any ergonomic change that you really harp on, what is this gonna do for you? As the, as the paramedic, okay? What, what is this gonna, how is this gonna help you? And that is so important. Access and storage is a key point. Obviously, you know, I can't tell you how many times I heard, we don't go back to the truck. It's gotta be with us. It's gotta go on the cot. Yeah, okay. So access and storage, was it accessible? Was it stored well? Those were key predictors. The other piece that was also very important was having a champion involved in the process. People who were like the early adopters who spread the word, uh, basically endorsing the device. Hey, you know, you already tried using this thing. It, it's really better on my back. You, you might find it useful. And boy, when you find those people, support them in any way possible. Because you know what? In, in the change literature, you know, somebody like me, I might be what's called a change agent. I'm an outsider. Management, they're a change agent. But, and, and you can recommend things, but the adoption process is not driven by change agents, it's driven by champions. You know, your peer group saying, hey, this is a good thing, okay? So, it's real important. So, in wrapping up here, um, we're about out of time. So, you know, what we know is that there are some engineering controls out there that can reduce the physical loads as you're loading cots, as you're getting people down the stairs. So, you know, we've heard, so, we saw some data earlier today that suggested that, you know, there's less injuries. This is the biomechanical data to support that as well, okay? There is less in the way of physical demands on these people as they're doing these tasks. So that should translate to less injuries. And like I say, there's been some data, but you know, again, you can use this to help fuel that argument that there's some people saying, well, I don't know, should we spend the money? Yeah, spend the money, because it shows that it matters, okay? This is a team effort that's been a lot of people involved in addition to us. Uh, some of my colleagues from the University of Illinois were involved in different stages, and we've had a, a whole bunch of different students involved here at different stages, it is indeed a team effort. So, you know, I want to thank you for your attention and I want to thank you as paramedics for everything you guys do to help people out there on the road every day.
And, you know, if we didn't put you to sleep during this period, that's great. If we did, I just want to say that there's a whole list of uh, references here that you could, if you have trouble sleeping, these will certainly take care of But if, if you need access to any of these things, just give us an email and we'll uh, send them to you. Okay, because now I understand not everybody has the kind of library access that university professors have. But with that, I'll turn it back over.